of breathing, which you just touched on. Uh, and again, can you describe for us uh, the need for that and why you found that, again, independently was another egregious violation in the standard of care? Correct. Earlier when I spoke, I was talking about the need for monitoring carbon dioxide, the need for monitoring these. But it has to be done continuously. It's not just that they weren't present. It's that even if they had been present, it has to be continuously checked. It has to be followed every few minutes for something like blood pressure or every few seconds like carbon dioxide and oxygen saturation in the blood. So there is a need not just to set these things in place, but to observe, to watch what's happening to the patient. And that is a different egregious violation, that continuous observation was not made, as evidenced by Conrad Murray's leaving the room and evidenced by a long period of phone calls and other distracting activities. And the outcome, Michael Jackson's death, is an expected consequence of failure to continuously monitor the patient. Now, Dr. Schaefer, earlier you had touched on, uh, from, a, from a medical doctor's point of view, that it would have been relatively easy to resuscitate Michael Jackson, assuming Conrad Murray is telling the truth that he'd only been gone for two minutes and found yes. him not breathing, correct? That's correct. Okay. And tying that in to this need then to constantly observe the breathing, uh, let's assume a doctor, a competent doctor, did constantly observe the breathing, and again, there was some sort of airway obstruction where the tongue fell back or something of that nature. Would you characterize uh, the subsequent resuscitation to be, from a medical point of view, relatively easy in nature? Yes. Okay. And if you're trained uh, in proper medicine and proper care and knew how to resuscitate the patient, uh, it would simply, as you described earlier, involve ventilating the patient, uh, allowing the effusion line to be turned off so no additional propofol is being administered? Yes. May, may I elaborate? Please. I have patients that stop breathing every day. When you induce anesthesia for surgery, we give doses so large enough that every patient stops breathing. It's just routine. It happens every day. It's no big deal because I know what to do. And I breathe for the patient for a few moments, and then I do something like either the laryngeal mask airway or the, the breathing tube that goes into the trachea to move air in and out of the patient. So every day I'm in the operating room, I have patients who stop breathing, completely expected, completely normal and routine. And it's no big deal because I'm right there I know it's going to happen. I'm giving the drugs. It does happen every time. I move air for the patient, and then I make some intervention so that there is a continuous flow of air to the patient. If Dr. Murray had been at the head of the bed and next to Michael Jackson and saw Michael Jackson stop breathing, he would simply have opened up the route for air, either chin lift, something simple, or perhaps ventilate Michael Jackson's lungs with that mask and that squeeze bag that I showed you, and nothing would have happened. There would have been no adverse outcome at all. You let me know, Mr. Waldron. We can take the mid-afternoon break. This is fine, Your Honor. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, let's take the mid-afternoon break. Of course, remember all the admonitions, and we'll be taking about 10 or 15 minutes, so... We'll do our buzzer connection with you at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Jones. In the Conrad Murray case, the defendant, Dr. Murray, is present with his counsel as before. The people by their counsel as before. Dr. Schaefer, once again, is present on the witness stand. All jurors and the five alternates have joined us. To everyone, good afternoon. Thank you. 
Good, good afternoon, afternoon, jurors. Good afternoon, Dr. Schaefer, sir. Thank you acknowledge you're still under oath and still sworn to tell the truth. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. This will be a resumption of direct examination by the people, Mr. Walgren. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Schaefer, we had left off. You had talked about two separate individual um, <coughs> egregious violations. You had mentioned the failure to continuously observe the mental status as well as the failure to continuously observe the breathing of Michael Jackson. Correct. You then in your report additionally note um, the failure to continuously monitor the patient by use of blood pressure monitors, uh, heart rate, and pulse oximetry. Now, is that correct? That is correct. And this continuous monitoring, uh, is that uh, additional to the need to have these monitors? There's also the additional requirement to continuously utilize these monitors and monitor the patient. That is correct. Individually, each of those represents an egregious violation. The distinction is it's one thing to place the monitor on and have it available. Not having the monitor is a problem. But if you place the monitor on the patient and you don't use it, you might as well not have it. So the failure to continuously monitor mental status, breathing, just by watching the chest rise and fall, oxygen saturation in the blood, the electrocardiogram, and the blood pressure, each one of those should have been monitored continuously during the administration of propofol, but they were not. And each of those individually is an egregious violation that could have led to the death of Michael Jackson. And in this particular case, uh, in your opinion, did that failure on each of those individually uh, directly contribute to the death of Michael Jackson? Yes. <laughs> now, again, you talked about the need to document uh, and keep records. Uh, you additionally note in your report the need to continuously document and keep the records during the course of sedation, noting such things as vital signs, uh, trends in the patient's condition and things of that nature. Can you elaborate on that, please? Yes. As you make the observation, you write it down. Among other things, it forces you to make the observation. It forces you to actually look and say, ah, five minutes are up. Let me write down the blood pressure. Let me write down how fast the person is breathing. Let me write down the heart rate. Making the observation and writing it down every five minutes forces you to do it and to document it. It's part of the act of giving care. If he had been doing that, he would have seen within a few moments when Michael Jackson stopped breathing, the oxygen saturation started to drop and eventually the electrocardiogram changed as Michael Jackson's heart was dying. And those would have been seen if he had been continuously observing them and writing them down, because it's the writing down that forces you to have this record. So it's the continuous documentation is also an egregious violation, the lack of continuous documentation. And this documentation, this need for it to be continuous, does this, um, as you had indicated earlier, this affects not only or is not only an egregious violation, but you indicated it was unconscionable and that it violated not only the patient's rights, but Michael Jackson's family's rights. Does that apply equally here? Yes. The family has the right to know what happened throughout the administration of propofol. That right has been denied to them. <clears throat> and is that, again, why uh, that being a fundamental right for both the patient and the patient's family is that why you found it to be both egregious and fundamentally unethical and unconscionable? Yes, it violated the rights of both Michael Jackson and the Jackson family. <clears throat> Dr. Schaefer, I want to talk, uh, as you did in your report, a little bit about the resuscitative efforts of Conrad Murray. And I want to begin initially 
with the uh, failure to timely call 911. You found that to be independently uh, an egregious violation, is that correct? Absolutely. And can you describe the doctor's, uh, a doctor's obligation in that situation when they find uh, an unresponsive patient? In that setting, it's almost impossible that Michael Jackson could have been revived given the status of his heart without assistance. You have to get advanced support there instantly. Instantly is within a few minutes. You have to call immediately. It's the most important thing that has to be done at the moment the disaster is realized. There is nothing that is a higher priority than calling for help at the moment of the disaster. And in this setting, with Dr. Murray there knowing full well that he does not have the equipment or the personnel necessary, calling for help, by that do you mean calling 911? Calling 911. Now, you had indicated in the uh, sedation video that we watched that documented the safeguards that are necessary, uh, that a, a doctor in that situation would uh, immediately assess the patient and then call for help. In the hospital, obviously, it wouldn't be 911. Uh, but in the home setting, then, would Dr. Murray be expected to immediately assess the situation and then call 911? That is correct. And the assessment would include what? The assessment would include uh, checking the pulse. Is the patient breathing? Is, the, is there a strong pulse? Uh, and looking for signs of responsiveness, you know, you literally shake the patient and you say, you know, we have a disaster on your hands. It, it takes a matter of seconds to make the assessment. And then 911 is called and there has to be a way of calling 911 giving propofol in somebody's bedroom. The need to possibly call 911 is quite obvious. So it is irrelevant. If there, were, if there are impediments to calling 911, the propofol should not have been given. 911 should have been called. It should have been called instantly. And access to a phone that can call 911 instantly was an essential requirement if one is to embark on giving drugs in someone's bedroom. Dr. Schaefer, I want you to assume that Conrad Murray became aware of Michael's condition sometime around noon. Yes. And that he then made a phone call at 1212 and left a voicemail message for an individual, Michael Amir Williams, and then had 911 called at 1220. Uh, so Let's assume that 20-minute delay in calling 911 and also assume that in the middle of that, at 1212, Conrad Murray actually called someone else, left a message, and made no indication that 911 was required. How would you assess those specific facts as it related to the care or lack thereof provided by Conrad Murray? That is so egregious that I actually find it difficult to even comprehend that you could have a patient who has arrested and you call and you leave a voice message for someone? It's just inconceivable to me that that is how a, physi a physician would not do that. A physician would not call when a patient has arrested and leave a voicemail for somebody. I, I almost don't know what to say. That is so completely and utterly inexcusable. Let's, let me ask you this. If, let's assume that Michael Jackson was alive. Um, and as Conrad Murray told the police, he then left for just two minutes. 